Welcome back to the Der Show. Um, I spent much of today uh, listening to the senators and the Judiciary Committee, Republicans and Democrats, questioning uh, Judge uh, Jackson. My, my first impression is whether you support Judge Jackson or not, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, you have to acknowledge she did a very, very good job. She came across really as the mirror image in some ways of, um, of, of Justice Barrett, who was the most recent appointee of the Supreme Court nominated by a Republican president. Both came across as very dedicated parents, uh, very smart, um, very uh, level-headed, uh, with different points of view. Uh, Judge Barrett is much more conservative, and we think, we have every reason to think, that uh, Judge Jackson is going to be far more liberal. But she didn't really reveal that very much today. She talked about not her judicial philosophy, not which justices she would emulate, but what her methodology is. And uh, if she follows that methodology, I think she'll be a, a great justice. She didn't basically say what Chief Justice Roberts said. I call balls and strikes like an umpire. Anybody who follows baseball, first of all, knows that some umpires have wider strike zones, higher, lower strike zones, some narrower. So even calling balls and strikes is discretionary. Maybe someday baseball will move toward, as the minor leagues have, uh, toward doing what uh, tennis is doing, and that is basically eliminating live umpiring and leaving everything to computers. I think baseball will always have umpires, but maybe they will have umpires with computers. That's not going to be so easy to do in baseball because, of course, even with computers, <clears throat> Height is going to be subjective, not width. Width is, it's the plate. There is a clear boundary. It's a little bit like the Constitution. Part of the Constitution is a dead Constitution. You have to be 35 years old uh, to be president, 30 years old to be a senator. Uh, but there are other parts of the Constitution, due process, equal protection, that allow for some discretionary application. The same thing is true with calling bulls and strikes. The width is fixed. A good computer will never make a mistake as to whether a ball is outside the strike zone or inside the strike zone. Um, curve ball sinkers, you know, you, you can argue a little bit. But as far as height is concerned, there's always going to be a little discretion because right now the height in baseball is determined by the size of the player, you know, knees to the armpits and that kind of thing. And that's never going to be subject to the same scientific rigor as the width of the plate. All right, I've diverted baseball. I love baseball. You probably know that. Uh, but let's talk about the confirmation hearings. I think she did a great job. I don't think the senators, for the most part, did great jobs. In fact, I have two words to describe in general the senators' approach. There are some exceptions to this, but generally it's partisan hypocrisy. Uh, remember, the same Democrats who today were saying, oh, of course, everybody has the right to counsel you. Don't judge uh, a lawyer by her clients, oh my God, yeah, she represented people uh, in Guantanamo and some of them may have been terrorists and murderers, but you don't judge a lawyer by their client. These were the same guys who attacked me for representing President uh, Trump and even beyond the Senate, some of the same people who canceled me, literally canceled me because I represented President Trump are now saying, oh, of course, everybody has the right to a defense. You don't criticize Judge Jackson for who she uh, defended. All right, the Democrats were hypocrites, but so were the Republicans. The Republicans who praised me for defending Trump, who went out of their way to say, oh, this is a liberal Democrat, and look how courageous he is. He's defending President Trump. Wow, he's a true American. He follows the Sixth and Seventh Amendment to the Constitution, the right to counsel. The same Republicans are now pointing to her to say, and you defended terrorists uh, in Guantanamo, and you sought the release of uh, murderers and, and, and others. Uh, so, you know, there's enough hypocrisy to go around. There's enough hypocrisy on both sides. Can't we agree that everybody has the right to counsel and that no lawyer should ever be criticized for defending a client, and no lawyer should be held accountable for what their client did. Yeah, I've defended accused murderers. Um, 
probably over 20 of them, and I've gotten the vast, vast majority of them acquitted. I don't support murder. I hate murder. I hate criminals. I don't like criminals. But I like our legal, I like our legal system. Um, you know, the, the great film and, and play A Man for All Seasons, uh, St. Thomas More talks about he would even give the benefit of the law to the devil. And his opponent said, you would cut, you would, you would give the, 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 the devil the benefit of the law. And he said, yes, I, I would do that for the sake of my own defense. And I would say for the sake of the American system of justice. Yes. So if the devil came down and was indicted and asked me to be his lawyer, I'm already called the devil's advocate. Might as well do it realistically. Yes, I would defend the devil. I would defend anybody accused of crime unless I had a conflict of interest. Obviously, I could not defend um, Adolf Hitler, who was responsible for killing family members of mine. And uh, uh, I, I would, if I got him in a room uh, in 1942, um, alone, um, I know what I would have done. If I had a gun, I would have pulled it out and shot him. Uh, or I would have strangled him with my bare hands. I, I think that killing Adolf Hitler would have been one of the greatest acts of civil disobedience imaginable. And I wouldn't have done it as a lawyer. I would have done it as a human being. I would have done it as a Jew. I would have done it as somebody who cares about human life. Yes, killing Adolf Hitler would have been a terrific thing to do. Um, but um, um, I would not, I could not have defended him because there'd be a conflict of interest. But if there were no conflict of interest, I would defend anybody, and uh, I would not want to be held to have the person's crimes attributable uh, to me. That's McCarthyism. Many of the people who defended people accused of communism were anti-communists. At Brooklyn College, when I was a student, I defended the right of communist teachers to teach, and I was a virulent anti-communist. I hated Stalin. My household you know, we equated Stalin with Hitler in many ways. He had murdered so many, so many uh, people. But I would defend the right. It's so important to defend everybody's right. But for most of the senators today, the right to defend a person depends on what party. Yes, the right to defend for me, but not for thee. The right to defend for my party, but not for your party. And so we've seen... Uh, a politicization of the process of confirmation. Let's just go back in, in history uh, for a while and understand how, how this happened. When I was a young law student, justices were confirmed 98 to 2 or, or 100 to nothing, um, whether they were liberals or, or conservatives. Um, uh, Justice Goldberg, for whom I clerked, got near unanimous uh, approval. Uh, others on the conservative side got near unanimous approval. It really all started with Robert Bork. Robert Bork was a conservative, uh, very conservative, um, nominated to the Supreme Court by a Republican president, and um, highly qualified. He was a professor at Yale. I think he taught at Chicago. Um, brilliant, brilliant. Uh, but his views were completely out of sync with the Democratic Party, who had a majority at the time in the, in the Senate. And uh, he opposed the woman's right to choose abortion. He opposed gay rights and gay marriage and a range of other social issues. And so the Democrats rejected him. He lost in a, in a, a close vote. There was also objection to him for what he did during the Nixon Saturday Night Massacre. You'll recall that Nixon fired the Attorney General of the United States and the Deputy Attorney General, um, but he couldn't fire all the rest of the people because the Justice Department had the authority to do that. So he asked Robert Bork, who was then the Solicitor General of the United States, to do his dirty work and fire all these people. I think Nixon had a conflict of interest. He was the one who was being investigated. And so I think that uh, Robert Bork behaved unethically and improperly. That's a basis for opposing somebody, but that's not why he lost. He lost because of his views on legal matters, constitutional uh, uh, matters. And, uh, but that started it. But even after Bork was defeated, 
Scalia gets nominated. Scalia is just as conservative as, as Bork. And he gets approved 98 to nothing. Why? Well, two reasons. One, Nino Scalia, who is a friend of mine, um, was a nice man. Everybody liked him. Everybody liked him. He was charming. He had a great sense of humor. He handled his confirmation hearings terrifically. Um, whereas Bork was a nasty guy. And uh, he confronted the senator and it was confrontational in a lot of different ways. People didn't like him. And uh, so he got defeated. Uh, Scalia, who was just as conservative, 98 to nothing. Another reason, of course, was Bork was a, a vanilla, white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant male, whereas you know, Scalia was the first Italian-American ever nominated to the United States Supreme Court, made it harder, of course, for Democrats to vote against him. But I think the reason he got nominated is, first of all, the Bork thing was regarded as a one-off. Turned out, of course, the Bork thing was not a one-off. Uh, it became the dominant approach. But even after Scalia, President Clinton uh, nominated Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, it's interesting, he called her a home run. Uh, I called her a ground rule double. Why well, would I call her a ground rule double, not a home run? She was very technical, and um, uh, she was a kind of technocrat, and um, I supported her, but I didn't think she was, at that time, the best possible nominee to the Supreme Court. She turned out to be a, a very good, a very good justice, but she also got confirmed overwhelmingly, but it started after that, and now, you know, if you get confirmed 52 to 48, it's a landslide, and so... Um, I don't know what the confirmation result will be. All I know is that there's a lot of hypocrisy going around, a lot of noise being made by, by senators, a lot of posturing. A lot of the senators just use the questioning as a way of expressing uh, upset about what had happened in the past. And, um, you know, the worst example, the worst example of the Supreme Court nominating process was the Republican refusal to give a hearing to Merrick Garland. And their phony excuse, phony baloney, was that it was eight or nine months, maybe even more, I don't remember, before a presidential election and a president who's a year away from being elected shouldn't have the right to nominate somebody to the Supreme Court. Uh, we should see who gets elected president next and that person should be allowed to fill the seat. Well, if that were a standard principle, okay, I could live with that. Uh, no president shall be allowed to nominate a justice to the Supreme Court within a year of an election. Okay, you can live with that if that's a principle. But then what happens is Ruth Bader Ginsburg dies um, just weeks before the 2020 presidential election and, and President Trump rushes to fill the seat with the nomination of a highly qualified candidate, obviously, um, uh, Justice Barrett. The Democrats object. They say, what about this year rule, the eight-month rule, the nine-month rule, 11-month rule? This is six weeks. Come on, apply the same standard. And I'll tell you what the Republicans did. They basically followed this joke. Uh, it's an old joke. It's a little, little a little um, maybe graphic, but it's the old joke. It's, the guy says, why do dogs lick their testicles? And the answer is, because they can. And that's what the Republicans basically say. We can. We have the presidency. We have the Senate. And we can break our rules. We can be hypocrites. You know, a few senators try to make up stories as to why there was a difference. Well, in one case, when Garland was nominated, a different party controlled the Senate and the presidency. Whereas with Trump, the same party controls the Senate and the presidency. It's not an argument. That's not a moral or legal argument. That's a, we do it because we can. We can because we control both the presidency and the Senate. That's a phony, phony argument. Let the Republicans at least acknowledge their hypocrisy. Let the Democrats acknowledge 
their hypocrisy for condemning me and people like me who defended President Trump and got accused of everything from treason to unethical conduct for daring to represent the President of the United States before the United States Senate. That's what the Democrats were complaining about. Now the Republicans are complaining about the same thing. Now each side, of course, has its point of view. Oh, there's no comparison between representing the president and representing somebody in Guantanamo. Both agree with that. There's no comparison between representing the president and representing somebody in Guantanamo. The only difference is Democrats say it's okay to represent murderers and terrorists, but not the president. And the Republicans say, it's okay to represent the president, but not murderers and terrorists. You can't have that kind of a rule. It's either okay or it's not okay to represent people who are facing serious consequences and who are claiming constitutional rights in both cases. The president claimed a constitutional right, which I vindicated in front of the Senate, the right to be impeached only for treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. And the prisoners in Guantanamo claimed a constitutional right, the right to be detained only after a due process trial, but not based simply on suspicion without proof beyond a reasonable doubt. So you can't persuade me that one side is better than the other. They're both wrong. Both sides should acknowledge that lawyers have the right, indeed the obligation, to defend people who are disagreeable, who may be dangerous, who have been accused of doing terrible things, whether they're a president being impeached or a terrorist being held in Guantanamo. And I'm calling for a single approach to this, not a multiple approach. So we'll hear, um, I think Judge Jackson has another day, um, maybe a little bit more. Um, she has understandably refused to answer questions as all nominees have refused to answer questions about how they decide particular cases. She's gone a little bit further in some cases saying things and a little bit further in not saying things. She would not describe a judicial philosophy, not because there would be an ethical problem in doing so, but because she says she doesn't have a judicial philosophy. She has a technique, a way in which she resolves cases, but she hasn't been on the Supreme Court, and, you know, she was right when she said, if you're a Court of Appeals judge or a district court judge, you don't really have a philosophy. I have to tell you, one of the greatest uh, justices in my experience in modern time was uh, Justice John Harlan, um, and he didn't have a judicial philosophy. His philosophy was to take cases as they come, every single case. He didn't have an overarching way of looking at cases from 10,000 feet and then filling in the fact. He, he did it deductively. He, um, he, he started out with certain premises and then inductively he looked at all the facts and uh, made a decision. And maybe if you looked at his oeuvre on the Supreme Court, his many years of decisions, maybe you can figure out what his philosophy was in retrospect. But he didn't decide cases based on a philosophy. He decided cases based on individualization and a desire to apply to the law, to the facts. You know, you can make broad arguments. Oh, my philosophy is to do justice. Even that's disputed. The famous story, I think I mentioned it before, of Oliver Wendell Holmes, law clerk, who comes to him and says, but Mr. Justice, this opinion doesn't do justice. And Holmes said, Young man, we're not in the justice business, we're in the law business. Um, you have to apply the law. And if you apply the law, the end result may be justice. And if you think the end result is not justice, change that legislatively. Um, change it by constitutional amendment. But the role of the judge is to apply the law to the facts and not to become uh, second legislatures. Uh, as Justice Scalia used to remind us, Nine justices in the Supreme Court have very little experience in the real world, especially this court. Most of them are graduates of Harvard, Yale, one from Notre Dame, elite schools. Um, um, very few of them have had street experience on a mayor has, and so now does Judge Jackson. But, you know, 
most of the others don't have a lot of street experience. Look, I've had good friends on the su Supreme Court. Steve Breyer was a good friend, great guy and terrific judge and good lawyer, but not a lot of street experience. Elena Kagan played poker with her uh, when she was dean of the Harvard uh, Law School. Again, very good teacher, very good justice, not a lot of street experience. Neither of them probably could successfully run for Congress or for the Senate. And decisions, hard decisions, um, should be made largely by elected representatives who have experience, who go back every weekend to the constituents and know what their constituents want. Justices aren't best equipped to make those decisions. They are very well equipped to serve as a check and balance on the excesses of the elected branches of government. And that should be their primary responsibility, to serve as a check and balance. Remember, our system of justice, our tripartite system of justice, the only country in the world who did this. Remember, almost every other country in the world um, has a parliamentary system. In fact, one of my letters today, I was going to read it, so I'll talk about it now, was why don't we just have a president impeachable if the public loses confidence in him? That's not an unreasonable approach. It's called the parliamentary system. In England and France and Italy and Israel and many other countries, if a president, a prime minister in those cases, uh, loses the confidence of the parliament or the Knesset, they simply vote against him and he's no longer the prime minister. Uh, that's the system we rejected when we fought the revolution. And Madison opposed efforts to make impeachment easier, saying that would turn us into a parliamentary system. So we're not a parliamentary system. We're a system with a strong executive, separate from the legislature. Remember what a prime minister is. He is simply a minister who is the first minister, almost always a member of the parliament, subject to legislative control. That's not the American system. Our system was not built for efficiency. It was not designed to get things done quickly. If you want to get things done quickly, you have one system. You have a unicameral legislature, that is one house. You have no veto by the executive, and you'll get a lot of things done. It's not our system. Our system has more checks and balances than any other system in the world because we fought against tyranny. We don't want kings. We want responsible elected officials who are subject to being checked by the judiciary and by the people. And so we have opted for an inefficient system, but a system that has protected us against tyranny for 225 or more years. And we have the most enduring constitution in the history of the world. Let's not fritter it away. Our constitution is partly dead and it's partly living. And it's always gonna be that way because no parchment preachment, which is what a constitution is, can ever anticipate every change and every development. And if you're gonna expound on a constitution, and J Judge Justice Marshall, the great fourth chief justice of the United States reminded us, it is a constitution we are expounding a document designed to last for the ages. And um, the nine justices of the Supreme Court are the custodians, the ultimate custodians of that great uh, document. So let's continue to listen uh, to Judge Jackson. Let's hope the senators begin to ask questions that don't reflect their own partisan interests. Some of the questions have been very good, very good. And some of the senators have shown they actually know how to ask a follow-up question. Most of them are just reading from documents that were prepared by their assistants. But let's have more uh, conversation with Judge Jackson, and then let's have a vote. I would like to see an overwhelming vote in favor of Judge Jackson. I would like to see us change our approach and begin to confirm justices unanimously or near unanimously the way Scalia and Ginsburg. It's not going to happen. But I would like to at least see 55 to 45 rather than 51 to 49. And as you know, if it's 50 to 50, it's not clear in the Constitution that the vice president can break that tie in favor of the nominee. Probably would happen. We probably won't know because it won't be 50-50, but the Constitution is not clear on that issue because to allow the vice president to break a tie means that the executive 
both nominates and confirms, which certainly was not the intent of the framers. And it means that somebody serves for a lifetime, could be 40 years, on the Supreme Court based on a tie vote. I don't think that's what the framers had in mind. So let's turn now to some of your questions. The first question was about Robert, Robert Bork, but I answered that. Um, so let's get to your other questions. Oh, my next question was about a 50-50 tie. So I've answered that. So let's turn to this question. Remember yesterday I talked about uh, um, Judge Jackson when she was a kid, uh, uh, a college student, and the Confederate flag being flown. And I, I told the story about my encounter with her back in 1991. And so the first question is uh, from Hoopshot. Uh, what should Harvard have done? Should it allow swastikas and Confederate flags everywhere? What if hallways or the dormitories were plastered with such hate symbols? Should and could Harvard ban all signs from dormitory windows? The answer is yes. Uh, it's, and, and so could a government. A government has the right to limit time and manner and place restrictions on free speech. So the university could, and I would have supported it, say no ban is outside of any windows, period. Uh, windows of dormitories are not venues for the expression of political views. But if they allow some political views, they can't ban other political views. So the question is completely of, of ism equity. You have to have ism equity. And of course, the student who put up the swastika took advantage of that. Now, it was offensive to put up a swastika. I think it was offensive to put up a Confederate flag. But the university had no business saying some signs are okay, other signs are not okay. But they could have, maybe should have. I think BU, Boston University, did pass a rule saying no signs outside of dorm windows. These are our homes. Look, when you live in condominiums, there are restrictions on the signs you can put up. Of course, condominiums are private and, uh, private uh, places, whereas public universities uh, do have an obligation to satisfy the First Amendment. So, okay, now let's see what else we have. Um, okay, we have a lot of attacks, ignorant, stupid, racist attacks on, on Judge Jackson. And I'll just, just read a few to give you a sense. Absolutely no. She should be convicted and sent to the pokey for the rest of her natural life for giving sex offenders lighter sentences than legally mandated. Well, you know, she explained that. She explained she was on the Sentencing Commission. She explained there are different levels that if you have somebody who merely looked at a picture once, that's very different than somebody who molested children or did anything like that. And that's what sentencing is supposed to take account of. Then you have this ignorant bigotry. I'll read the name because it's such ignorant bigotry. High-tech redneck. I don't know about the high-tech. The redneck is clear. 93% of homos are pedophiles. Any bottom is top. It just, it's a lie. It's a lie. I don't even think there's evidence that there's any relationship between pedophilia and, and homosexuality. Uh, but certainly this statistic is just made up. It's just made up. It's a lie. It's bigoted. It's wrong. It's false. And I, I read it only to show the absurdity. Um, and there are more and more. Hell no! She has countless innocent children's blood on her hands. You know, grow up, you guys. This is uh, Quinna Beth uh, saying that. She doesn't have the blood of anybody on her hands. She sends all these people uh, to, to prison. Um, then we have some, some, you know, don't agree with Dersh, but have learned a ton. We'll check out his Locals page, too. Locals is interesting because that's every day. I just rant for a minute or two minutes and give you my views on what's going on today. So if you don't have the patience to have a half an hour of me, uh, you can get two minutes of me on, on Locals. Um, um, no, no, no. She systematically ruled against the Constitution every single case. Check out her past rulings. Well, I've checked out her past rulings. She's made very, very, very few constitutional rulings, and that's true of most appellate court judges or district court judges. And as far as I know, she's never ruled against the Constitution. In fact, the objection by some is that, you know, she, she might be too activist ruling in favor of the Constitution. Her goal is to return pedophiles and child molesters to the street as quickly as she can. The very reason Joe Biden wants her on the bench. I mean, is there no limit? to the stupidity and bigotry of some of my viewers. Um, you know, some people say I shouldn't read this stuff, but I think it's so important to let everybody know 
um, uh, what's going on. She's not qualified to be a meter maid. Uh, she is the one uh, whose apple will poison the whole lot. Does anyone out there know if Justice Clarence Thomas has a security detail around him? We don't want him to be Anthony Scalia. In other words, Scalia was murdered. We know that. Of course we know that. And, and, and Justice Thomas will be murdered as well. But uh, uh, the, the, the Judge, judge uh, Jackson um, shouldn't be confirmed. Um, no, she shouldn't be confirmed or even considered the lady defended serial killing terrorists in Gitmo. She also showed signs of being a blooming racist, clearly a terrible public defender. No, she was a great public defender. Everybody who has evaluated her record as a public defender, you don't like her because she won cases. And it's interesting, I'll end with a, an interesting uh, vignette about that. Uh, you know, after Jacksonian democracy was introduced in the 1830s, everything became elected. Uh, we, we were not a democracy when we were started. We were a republic, Benjamin Franklin, a republic if we can keep it. Jackson introduced democracy. He introduced elected prosecutors, elected judges, elected. Florida took it to its extreme. In Florida, they elect the public defender. The public defender, county by county, is elected. Okay, imagine the campaign for public defender. Candidate A, I went to Harvard Law School, I took all of Dershowitz's classes, I learned every trick in the trade, um, I'm master of the Constitution, uh, I know every defense possible. If you elect me public defender, I will free every murderer, robber, racist, and they'll fill the streets. Candidate B says, I went to Joe's bait shop and uh, uh, law school, I uh, cut most of my classes, I got C's and D's. I don't know anything about law, criminal law. If you elect me, every criminal is going to be convicted. Who do you think wins that election? You don't vote for public defenders. Public defenders should get appointed, obviously, as highly qualified defense attorneys. And uh, Judge uh, Jackson was a highly qualified public defender. How do I know that? Because one of my friends, who's one of the best lawyers in the world, uh, Nathan Lewin hired her uh, based in part on her record as a uh, public uh, defender. And he ran one of the most elite, best law firms in Washington, D.C. Look, you might not like her, you might disapprove of reviews, but don't insult her ability as a lawyer. I, the same thing happened to me. Uh, you know, whatever you can say about me, say whatever you want. You don't like me, you don't like my views, you don't like my clients. But you cannot credibly say I'm not a good lawyer. Look at my record. Um, but people say that. Oh, he can't be a good lawyer because he defended Trump. Or he can't be a good lawyer because he defended O.J. Simpson. Or he can't be a good lawyer because he represented Leona Helmsley or Mike Tyson or uh, you name it. No, you might not like my clients. You might not like me. But don't tell me I'm not a good lawyer. And don't tell me that uh, Judge Jackson was not a good public defender. So let's try to elevate the debate over Judge Jackson and over future Supreme Court nominations. Let's try to get partisanship out of the process. Let's try to reduce hypocrisy. We'll never eliminate it. Hypocrisy is the currency of the realm in politics today, unfortunately. Uh, I have a new book coming out soon called The Price of Principle, how uh, partisanship and uh, dishonesty basically uh, Trump's um, consistency and principle, and how being principled can cost you jobs, professional uh, bases, and, and friendships even. So uh, on this show, we're going to talk about principle, and you might not like it, and, uh, and send me your letters. Uh, try to keep your letters principled. I think that would elevate the nature of the discussion. Look forward to seeing you tomorrow.